Snowed Up by Edwin Waugh, narrated by Mark Carroll. Introduction by the narrator. This story is set in the public house known as the White House, situated on the high ridge of Blackstone Edge, overlooking the counties of Lancashire and the West Riding of Yorkshire. In the days before steam engines replaced pack horses as the main source of transport, and before factory chimneys polluted the atmosphere of the Lancashire cotton and Yorkshire woollen districts. The White House still dominates the scene today and can be visited by any listener. Snowed Up, Chapter 1 Its cheerful light gleamed from afar upon the lonely hill, the moorland inn. It was drawing towards the close of a keen day in the depth of winter, The season had been unusually severe, ushered in by long frost and bitter winds, with fitful falls of snow, which now lay in deep drifts by the roadside, and in lonely creases of the moors. There they had lain for weeks, in great heaps of powdery crystal, glittering in the wintry sun, and lessening day by day under the action of the driving blast. But a change was coming over the wintry scene. A moister air had begun to soften the frozen ground, and as daylight declined upon the bleak range of hills that divides Lancashire from Yorkshire, a steady wind set in from the northwest, and the sky became overcast. Indeed, there was every indication that a wild storm was at hand, and the moorland cottager shivered as he closed his door. Upon the rising gale. God help the poor, Who in lone valleys dwell, Or by far hills, Where wind and heather grow. Theirs is a story sad indeed to tell. Cold snow drifts deep, Around the fireless cot, And blocks the door. The night storm howls a dirge, O'er moss and moor. Jowser Quifters, The bullet-headed ostler, at the old moorland inn called the White House, near the top of Blackstone Edge, was whistling and singing by fits as he swept the yard of the hostelry, glancing now and then at the kitchen window and longing for the landlady to call him in to his bagging, which is the name country folk in Lancashire give to their afternoon meal, or the meal which comes between dinner and supper time. Giles was a strong, round-limbed, keen-bitten lad of the old Saxon breed, deep-blooming, blunt and true, a rare trencherman, and a hearty fellow both at work and at meat. Indeed, he was steadfast and thorough at anything he took in hand. Giles Aquifters was well worth his meat, and there was no fear of his being stinted at that house where the old landlady's cry to her servants at meal time was, Now get summer into you, for there's nobody can do as they should do, if they don't eat as they should do. He was an especial favourite with the landlady too, although he was sometimes unmanageable by anybody else, and Giles was as fond of her as if she'd been his own mother. God bless yon out, Cretter, he would say sometimes. I'd go on me hands and knees to thank you well for her. Who knows the temper of my inside to a year? Who gives me run up buttery night and day? God bless her out so. Never a better hearted woman trod shoe leather than who is never. I wish young Baggin were ready, continued he giving another glance at the kitchen window as he swept the yard, and then he began to sing to the stroke of his besom. Lithe and strung and fresh and young, too blue twinkling in, staunch as steel, I like him wheel, the pride of Ripley Green. Brave have the cap as are, the prize he has won, and he's carried it away. Giles swept and sang, and still no signal was given at the glowing kitchen window of the White House. But he knew right well that the evening meal was preparing, 
for a faint hissing sound issued from the quarter of the house, which made his teeth shoot water, and the jingle of the tea things was music in his ears. The rising wind was beginning to roar around the walls of the old house, as if enraged at the resistance they opposed to the fury of the storm. Day was darkening down upon the moors, and the dense clouds now fast overspreading the sky deepened the evening gloom. The sudden change began to attract the attention of Giles, and as he leaned upon the handle of his broom and gazed aloft, he muttered to himself, We're bound to have a wild night. There'll be heavy downfall, a some mat, and soon too. As he stood thus, gazing now at the sky, where the clouds were gathering like armies moving to battle, now at the darkening moor, across which the keen wind was rushing with fierce and unrestrained sweep, he heard the tramp of a traveller's feet descending the road. Giles fixed his eyes on the house end, by which the road passes, and in a minute or so a sturdy fellow, in the dress of a quarryman, made his appearance. He was trudging steadily on, down the middle of the highway, staff in hand, with his eyes fixed upon the ground, when Giles shouted to him, Now then, Sam, cried he, where to for? Hello, Giles, our lad, replied the quarryman. Is that thee? It's all that there is left of me, said Giles. But where to for? That's in a terrible pail. That is a hurry. I'm for yon bit at place at bottom at Brew meaning the village of Littleborough, at the foot of the hill, three miles off. Are to know him for calling in, then, said Giles. Nay, replied the quarryman, I want to get down thill afore this storm comes on. It's bound to be a rough night, but look on it. It favours it, for sure, answered Giles. Well, I think I'll be getting on, said the quarryman, afore dark overtakes me. Stop a minute, mon, cried Giles. What, there's nobody at Thouse dying, is there? No, but mon, replied the quarryman. We ain't had enough of that muck of work at our house. I'll well, tap thy wind half a minute. How are they getting on in Turvin, yon? Giles alluded to the wild slough of Turvin, one of the most picturesque ravines in that mountain range. Oh, thou bat! replied the quarryman. Thou bat! Delph Robin broke his leg in a battle at Todmorden t'other day, and Iron Jack's been ta'en up for neat hunting again. Aye, bat, mon, said Giles. That's about thou bat, as they says. You don't alter much down in Turvin, I think. If they don't alter, continued the quarryman, it's for worse. Bite mass, said Giles, I think so. Well, said the quarryman, setting his staff firmly in the road and crossing his legs. Well, and when does this Rosslyn match of thine come off, Giles? Next Thursday. Well, and what mack of fettle art in, thinkst thou? Oh, as reet as a ribbon, answered Giles. Thou mun mind what thou'rt doing, continued the quarryman. He's a strong fella, is Joan. Oh, I know him replied Giles. I know him well enough. I've had a twirl or two with him afore, but he's like as if he's no one settled in his mind about it. If ever I leet on him, when he's had a jill or two, he's sure to begin hectoring a bit. Tha knows, he's rather of a masterful turn, and it goes terrible against grain for him to lose. So I's be like to give him another chance. Oh, I'm no one flayed on him, Sam, not I. But if he happens to get throat again this time, I'll make him worn her ever. He will slatter some gamble off at Thedger at under lip of his. He's bad to bide sometimes, the nose. I shouldn't wonder, but as had to try to tan his hide a bit in the end of all. Can't I beat him, thinks to? said the quarryman. Beat him, replied Giles. I tell how I'm no one flayed on him, Sam. I don't want to swagger naught about it, but I've tried best the Anunt Rippenden side, a bum once, 
and he's none at best, I can tell her. He isn't that, be a long chalk. I've tried em all round, I tell her, and I dare tackle em again, one after another, for end to end, come cut and long tail. I'll have no quietness of thy life, till I's gan it him soundly, said the quarryman. I doubt it'll end so, replied Giles, but we we'll see in a bit. Just then the kitchen door opened, and the landlady cried out, Giles, come to thy bagging. That's the map, said Giles, giving a twirl round upon one heel and flinging his besom into the corner. That's the map. I've been waiting on that a good while. Come in a minute, Sam. Bowed and bonny, frank and free, if I've honey, bill for me. Come thy ways in, Sam, come thy ways in, and quiff an odd tot off, afore thy goes damp brew, that knowing in that hurry. The sky was now completely saddened with the gathering storm, and through the deepening gloom the snow was beginning to descend in thin, wavering flakes as Giles entered the house, followed by the quarryman, who muttered as he closed the door behind him, I must stop here money minutes. It'll be a wheel neat, this neat, and it's a rough road down the hillside in dark. Come, Giles, said the landlady, set her down, and let's get this bag in or. I'm willing, replied Giles, taking his seat at the table. I think thou'rt generally ready for thy meals, old lad, said the quarryman, addressing Giles. Aye, said the landlady, he's ready for him afore they're ready for him sometimes. I go out short, said Giles. Well, you don't need to go short in this house, replied the landlady. All right, said Giles. The house was unusually still. The last coach had long since gone down the hill into Lancashire, the bustle of horses and thirsty travellers had sunk into silence, and the notes of the guard's retiring bugle had died out upon the wild moorside. The shades of evening had folded away from view the towns and villages which dotted the wild landscape, spreading far away from the foot of Blackstone Edge, and the light of the White House windows shone upon the dark mountain top like a solitary star peeping through the curtains of a cloudy night. The old hostelry, called the White House, near the top of Blackstone Edge, has long been a famous place. Its storm-beaten sign still exhibits some faint pictorial relics of a coach and horses, which was the original name given to the house, but it is far more widely known as the White House at Toppet Thedge. The latter name arises no doubt from the fact that its whitewashed walls are visible from eight to ten miles distance. In the valley of the Roach on the Lancashire side of the hills, it stands close by the side of the highway, which leads over that mountain ridge into the west riding of Yorkshire, and it is the last house upon the Lancashire side of the hills, the boundary stone of the two counties standing about five hundred yards beyond the house, close by the road. Upon the bleak moor side, about half a mile west of the inn, the well-defined line of an ancient Roman road runs almost parallel with the present highway. The Roman road is still a massively paven track for miles, although the great hewn blocks have been carried away here and there, and the ancient pathway is covered by the overgrowth and deposit of many centuries except where it has been cleared away by stone-getters for the sake of the ready-hewn blocks. The White House is substantially built of the rough stone with which those moorland hills abound, and, with its outhousing, it forms three sides of a square open to the roadside, an admirable arrangement for shelter in the stormy exposure of those wild heights. The kitchen occupies the central part of this range of building, and at night the light from its windows throws a cheery gleam upon the lonely road in front of the house and glows upon the hay-strewn space between the wings of the building, into which vehicles sometimes draw for cover when the weather is wild. In the old coaching days, when the road over Blackstone Edge was the principal route from Lancashire into Yorkshire, 
The White House was a scene of continual bustle. Wild and steep as that mountain path was, it was a much shorter route than through the long pass of the Todmorden Valley, now occupied by the railway. In those days, it was customary, before coaches ascended the hill from Littleborough on the Lancashire side, to add two additional horses to the team, which were left at the White House on the top of the edge when the coach went on. A ceaseless stream of commerce between the two manufacturing districts kept the house alive by night and day. So great was the traffic even then, and so famous the house as a baiting place, that its hearthstones had never time to cool. The walls of its kitchen were always aglow. The aroma of good cheer steeped the old place from the foundation to the roof, and the bustle of men and horses and the sound of revelry has scarcely died upon the midnight air before it began again, for, even throughout the night, carriers and other passengers were continually calling there. Amongst the varied traffic which then crossed those moorland wilds, there was one feature which has now altogether disappeared from the scene, or at least is only to be found amongst the most retired tracks of these northern hills. The feature of traffic to which I allude is the pack horse. In those days, long strings of pack horses trailing after each other in Indian file call now and then at the White House. In remote parts of these hills, they may even yet be found now and then, used chiefly for the conveyance of lime in panniers. They are still known by the name of lime gals or lime galloways. On the northeastern boundary of Rossendale Forest, there is an old mountain path, still known by the name of the Limer's Gate. But in past times, these rough ponies were used for the transit of woollens and other goods, as well as lime, hence their name, pack horses. In the ancient woollen towns of Lancashire and Yorkshire, the pack horse is a familiar sign amongst the old public houses, in the town of Rochdale, there is not only the Pack Horse Inn, but Packer Street, from whence woollen goods were dispatched upon Pack Horses and Packer Meadow, a meadow or field near Packer Street into which the Pack Horses were turned to graze. The railway has long since changed all this, and the Pack Horse is now a very rare sight indeed, except, as I have said before, in the wildest and most remote parts of the mountains where they are yet occasionally used in some purely local bit of traffic, in lime or coals, and in places where any other mode of conveyance would be almost impossible. The immense traffic of these more active times now thunders hour after hour, by night and day, along the picturesque valleys of the Todmorden district, leaving the old road over Blackstone Edge as silent as the bed of a diverted stream. The wild grouse upon those moorland heights is no longer startled from its heathery cover by the clatter of coach horses and the horn of the guard. No more the foaming team is pulled up at the end of the white house, whilst frost-bitten travellers dismount from their cold perch to swing their arms and stamp about the pavement and rush into the shelter of the inn to restore the circulation a little before descending that wild road on the Lancashire side of the hills. In the old coach times, the White House was known far and wide, on both sides of the hills, as an excellent place of entertainment, as it is in some degree, even now, when railways have drawn away the traffic into another direction, leaving the old house comparatively lonely, perched there near the summit of Blackstone Edge as if he was listening in thoughtful amazement to the railway trains rushing night and day along the foot of the hill. But the White House was a famous hostelry before railways were dreamt of. Fifty years ago, any traveller who came up there in stormy weather would not be unlikely to hail its genial shade whether he came from the Lancashire or the Yorkshire side of the hills. The old seven miles from Sowerby Bridge in Yorkshire up to the White House is a continual ascent through a wild scene 
and half a century ago, there was hardly any place of shelter and refreshment between the two, except at the old village of Rippenden, about five miles from the top of the edge, and though much of the route lay between the shelter of picturesque hills, the ways were foul, and the toilsome ascent ended in a long tract of open moorland, more than a thousand feet above the sea, across which the storm swept with unrestrained fury, and although the distance between the village of Littleborough, at the foot of the mountain on the Lancashire side, and the White House was only three miles, it was one wild, unsheltered ascent, for the most part much steeper than the approach on the Yorkshire side, so that whether the traveller had climbed the edge from the Yorkshire or from the Lancashire side, the White House would be a welcome resting place. In those days it saw a great deal of curious company, company marked with characteristics which have now entirely disappeared, and it was the scene of many a curious adventure, out of which strange stories have grown. Being, as I have said before, the last inn, indeed the last building of any kind upon the Lancashire side of the hill, it was a kind of farewell inn to those who were leaving the land of the Red Rose, and, of course, to those who came across the Yorkshire border. The genial cheer within its weathery beaten walls was the first welcome they met with, and a right cosy nest it was for the weary traveller in those days. The house was a paragon of cleanliness and comfort. The accommodations were excellent, the fare was bountiful, and of the best quality, and the charges were moderate. In addition to all this, Joe Faulkner, the landlord, who was a retired coachman well known upon that road, was the very king of good fellows. He was a general favourite with high and low, and no wonder, for he was a singularly good-natured man, humorous, attentive, and obliging to rich and poor. He was a fellow of infinite jest too, and his memory was replete with a world of racy anecdote picked up during his coaching days. No wonder that Joe Faulkner was a favourite. Besides, he had another rare quality for a landlord. He was a man of strong physique, with a brain that could stand a great deal of drink when circumstances drew him into an unusual carouse. For, when left to himself, he was a man of comparatively sober habit, in his cups, though, Joe's old nature seemed to light up with good nature and racy humour. However long the revel lasted, his spirits never seemed to flag, and on the following morning he was out before six as usual, looking after the stabling or stalking about the open moorside, seemingly as fresh as a new-sprung lark whilst his companions of the previous night were sleeping off the fumes of their late revel. Such was the White House fifty years ago, and such was its landlord at that time. It is a well-conditioned inn yet, although a comparatively quiet house, and the company it sees now is of a different and much less varied character from that which swarmed within its walls in the old days. Foot travellers over the edge, stone-getters and moorland folk, are now its principal customers. In summer and autumn, it is a favourite resort of sportsmen and gamekeepers, and of holiday folk from the villages and towns on both sides of the hill, with whom a trip to the top of Blackstone Edge and a visit to the famous crag, known by the name of Robin Hood's Bed, is a favourite excursion, and on a fine day the view from the White House across South Lancashire, when its populous towns and villages right out to the Irish Sea, is very fine. On the evening of our story, the kitchen of the White House was a scene of comfort and cleanliness, which contrasted finely with the storm which was beginning to drive wildly across the moorland waste outside. The evening meal was spread upon the white scoured table, and the servants were already seated at the board except Giles, who came into the kitchen smiling and rubbing his hands, followed by his friend the quarryman, with whom he had been conversing in the yard. Come, Giles, said the landlady, come, and let's get this bag in o'er, and then go and look at Thorses. 
He had declared it snowing, continued she, looking through the window, where the white flakes were flying by thicker every minute. Snowing, replied the quarryman, as he closed the door behind him. It'll be a white world afore morning, you see. It's queer to me if this doesn't turn out a rough neat. I'll just have our Jill, and then my best of me gate down thill before it gets dark. My mon, continued he, rubbing his hands, that's a rare fire, mistress. Bring me a warm pint. And he drew up a chair to the hearth. Giles had already planted himself by the boardside, and was silently and steadily concentrating his attention upon a savoury dish of ham and eggs in front of him. The only other person in the kitchen except the quarryman, who did not belong to the household, was an old peddler, who sat close by the fireside with his pot upon the hob at his elbow. Joe Faulkner, the landlord, was snugly seated in a cosy parlour in one of the wings of the house, chirruping with two jovial Yorkshire travellers and the quaint sexton of Rochdale, who was an old friend and boon companion of his, and who had called on his way homeward from a visit to the village of Rippendon. Now then, said the landlady, and in the quarryman his drink, see if it's sweet enough. The quarryman took a steady pull at the old rust compound, and then smacking his lips with an air of quiet satisfaction, he said, Aye, it'll do. That's better than a slapping chops with a snowball on a neat like this. Come, here's luck a piece. And he drank again. Here, Giles, said he, holding out the pot to his friend. When a thou taste with me, it's good tacking. So party, old lad, it'll make thy year cool. Giles, who was still too deeply engaged to say much about anything, turned half round upon his seat and took hold of the picture, and looked into it, and then giving a little sideways nod of the head towards his friend, he said, Well, come, do, replied the quarryman, and then the pot went to Giles' lips as natural as life. The old peddler's eyes began to twinkle. He had got planted unto right fast by thingle bleezing finely. He had been silently listening to the gathering storm, and as he watched the snowflakes flying by the window in the gloom outside, he felt every moment less inclination than before to leave the comfortable corner he was in, especially when he bethought him of the wild walk which lay between him and the village of Littleborough at the foot of the hill, where he had no hope of finding better quarters than those he was in. Besides, a peal of laughter came now and then from the parlour, where the landlord and his friends were carousing, and from the general tenancy of things he began to think there would be a little fun in the White House that night. Altogether the old man had inwardly resolved to remain where he was till morning, if they would only let him stay, and he knew the people too well to fear that they would turn him out into the wintry night on that wild moor top. And so, glancing again almost with a feeling of satisfaction at the rising storm, he drew his chair closer to the hob, crossed his legs, and emptying his picture, he handed it to the landlady and said, Come, I think I can manage another. Ain't I better warm it for you? she said as she took the pot from him. Do, replied the old man, do, and put a bit of sugar and nut back in. I've had a hard day. I dare say you am, replied she, glancing at his grey hair and nip features. And when she brewed the old man's drink, she said as she set the pot down again upon the hob at his elbow, There, see ya, that'll do ya good. God bless yous, said the old man as he took up the pot and drank. The snow was falling thicker and faster every minute, in a more steady and downright descent. The wind had sunk down into a sullen moan, and an awful hush settled upon the scene. The power of the silence of the mountains, the awe that dwelleth in them, high and far, was deepened into appalling grandeur by the wild storm, which fell upon Blackstone Edge that night, and a death-like stillness seemed to pervade the whole of the wide landscape, spreading out far away from the foot of the hills to the sea. 
The million-footed snow came steadily and silently down, and the dirge-like moan of the wind was the only sound to be heard. God help thee, traveller, on thy journey far. The wind is bitter keen, the snow overlays, the hidden pits and dangerous hollow ways. And darkness will involve thee, no kind star tonight will guide thee, traveller, and the war of winds and elements on thy head will break, and in thy agonizing ear the shriek of spirits howling on their stormy car. With oft appalling ring I portend a dismal night. But the White House glowed on the lonely mountain top that night like a good deed in a naughty world. The servants had finished their evening meal, and the landlady, rising from her rocking chair by the fireside, said, Now, lasses, get these things sided, and then go and finish what you want to do. Mary, thou better stop here and help to wait on, and Giles, hadn't thou better go and get Thorses done up, and mind the leaks in stable, whatever thou does. I'm terrible frightened of fire. Elsie, thou knows there's young cows to milk. Come, do stir ye. Giles, put that door to when thou goes out. There'll be not more in tonight, I dare say. Eee, how it's coming down, continues she, as she took her seat by the fire again, with her knitting in her hand. Coming down, said Giles, gazing round, when he'd opened the door. By mon, it's coming down solid. Eee, what a change. I never seen naught like this. If aught comes into this house tonight, they shall come soon, or else they'll have our job as who they are. Sit thou, Sam, look here. The quarryman ran to the door. He bite mass, cried he, as he looked around. Why, it's coming down thick and threefold. It's much if you're not snore up afore morning. Come, I'll go and finish me gel, and then I'll be travelling on. But it'll be easier going down the hill than to the gate on. Well, I'll go and get me horses done up, said Giles darting towards the stables through the thick falling snow. Shut that door, cried the landlady. It swales these candles so. The quarryman closed the door behind him and sauntered back towards his seat in the kitchen, as if debating in his mind whether he had not better keep the safe side of the house for that night. Well, what's it like? said the landlady. Like, replied the quarryman as he sat down again. It's like being snowed up, if ever aught were like it in this world. They're well off that's nowhere to go this neat, I can tell you. Here, I'll see, continued he. Bring me another gel. It's no use deeing in shell. Warm, said the girl as she took the pot from him. Aye, warm, replied he. Very warm, and we'll sweeten. Don't you think you can manage, don't fill in, dart then, said the landlady. Well, I've done afore money a good time, replied the quarryman, and as be like to try it again, I guess. But we and see, in a bit. Are you bound down brute to eat, meister? Continued he, turning to the old peddler. Well, said the old man, glancing timidly at the landlady. Well, that depends. Aye, replied the quarryman, drawing his chair nearer to the fire. That depends, as you're saying. Eo said the landlady, it would hardly be fit for him to turn out such a neat as this. Besides, he's had a dree day, I dare say. I have, very, replied the peddler. And it's hard of your time of life, continued the landlady. It is, very, answered the old peddler, taking another sip at his warm drink. It's naught else, said the quarryman. And it's no unfit to turn a dug out upon Blackstone Edge this night. It'll happen clear up in a bit, said the old man in a tremulous voice. It happen well, replied the quarryman, but not this night, I doubt. Ailsie, continued he, turning towards the girl, who was grating the nutmeg into his ale. Ailsie, is that Jill ready? Come in, said the girl, as she stirred in with the spoon. 
That'll do, said the quarryman, throwing one leg over the other with a satisfied air. When the girl handed his drink to him, the quarryman fondled the bottom of the pitcher with one hand, and he gazed silently into the fire for a minute or so. Then, quietly raising the pot towards his lips, he looked first at the old peddler and then at the landlady, and he said, Well, come, here's wishing that no one as may never feel no one to know, no one feeling neither. De same here, replied the old peddler, tasting his drink again. Thank you, said the landlady. That's a wish that'll do nobody no harm. And then they all seemed to knit closer round the fire and listened to the spellbound silence outside, broken only by the moan of the wind as it flew by the window, thick laden with ghost-like flakes of snow. The old peddler sipped at his drink again and then set it quietly down upon the hob as if he was afraid of the sound being heard. The landlady went on with her knitting and swaying herself to and fro in her chair in silence, and the quarryman sat with his legs crossed, gazing silently into the fire, and for a minute or two there was not a sound to be heard in the kitchen, but the tick of the old clock in the corner, the creak of the landlady's rocking chair, the chirp of two or three loud crickets, and now and then a little jingle among the tea things which the girl was putting away for the night. All this while the snow was descending heavier and heavier, and the white pile rising upon the window ledge outside began to glare through the lowmost panes like a ghastly face. The doors rattled, the snow drifted into the lobby, and the wintry blast moaned wild across the lonely moor. It was the beginning of a fearful night. Ailsie, said the landlady, Tell them to bring some more coals to this fire and sweep this hearth up. I don't like to see an untidy fireplace and go and see what they want in it parlour. That bell's rung twice and the stops there staring as if they'd never hear such a thing as a bell in thy life before. Come stir thou last do. E, I'll tell you what, continued she, addressing the quarryman. This is terrible weather for poor folk. An old folk, and folk that's ill clad and ill fed. It is so, replied the quarryman. Ay, ay, continued the landlady. When the body gets crazed with age, when the blood gets thin and the een dim, and folks are past service and poverty stricken and forgotten, e winter mun be a terrible time to such as them in their bits of cowed notes. God help em, God help em, and God help us all, replied the quarryman. Well, continued the landlady, we every one need an his help, for we know but poor things best on us when we come in to be tried. There's something in that, said the old peddler in a timid whisper, and then they sat silent again for a minute or two. I'll tell you what, said the quarryman, looking dreamily into his half-empty picture. To the best of my belief, t'one half at world dunna know how t'other half lives. No, they don't, replied the landlady, and what makes it worse is that the bigger half on them doesn't care. There's something in that too, whispered the old peddler. Forgive us our sins, said the quarryman, looking into his pot again. Aye, aye, replied the landlady, forgive us our sins, for we need it, and help us to forgive one another. Folk are too hard on folk, it's a great pity. It is, it is, whispered the old peddler, tasting his drink again. It is, continued he, as he laid the pot quietly down again upon the hob. It is for sure, there's something in that. Well, come said the quarryman, lifting his picture towards his lips. The Lord save us and bless us all, and help us to do as we shouldn't do as long as we're living. Amen, whispered the old peddler. Amen, with all me heart. Elsie, said the landlady, yon's the cap you in at door. Go and let it in, poor thing. It's enough to starve an otter. 
I couldn't find it in me heart to shut the door again I rattin such a night as this. The girl went and opened the door, and the wintry gush rushed coldly through the house, swaling the candles wildly and whirling the snow into the kitchen. The cat came mewing pitifully up to its mistress, its hair all bristled with cold and sparkling with snow. E, it is such a night, said the girl as she entered the kitchen again, staring with astonished eyes. It is such a night, I'd hard work to put door to again. Come out, lad, said the quarryman, laying his hand upon the peddler's knee. Come, just have an odd talk with me. Well, thank you, replied the old man, sipping up the last drop in the pot, which he had been nursing some time. Thank you. I don't mind. Here, Elsie, said the quarryman, fill thou chappy's pitcher and make it good. Come, I'll doctor it for him, said the landlady, laying her knitting down and taking the pitcher from the girl. There, said the landlady, stirring the peddler's drink as she laid it down upon the hob beside him. There, make yourself comfortable. You and be like to stop all night. We'll find you a bed and welcome. Can you find me a bit of a booze too, thinking you? said the quarryman. To be sure we can, replied the landlady. You can sleep with the old man here if you like. The quarryman gave a sly glance at the old peddler's shirt, and then he looked into the fire, and then, turning to the landlady, he said, Who sleeps with Giles? He sleeps by himself, replied she. Then Giles and me can sleep together, said the quarryman. We're used to one another, and I want a bit of a chat with him. So be it then, replied the landlady. Fold a diddle I do, cried the quarryman, throwing one leg over the other and snapping his fingers. Fold a diddle I do, that's settled. Here, I'll see. Bring me another pint. The fun in the parlour had been going on as if the company there were heedless or unwitting of the storm. But now the parlour door opened and the voices of the landlord and his friend the sexton were heard in the lobby. Well, said the landlord as he shook hands with his friend, when are we to see that face and iron at top of Blackstone Edge again? Oh, before arts long, replied the sexton. Come, continued the landlord, I'll go to thou's end and see thou off. But when he opened the door, he cried, E hey, Lord, what a neat, while they'll never be able to get down, brew. I shouldn't like to face that for sure, replied the sexton. Here, said the landlord, let's put that door to, come thy ways in, and let's go and see how they're getting on in the kitchen. <laughs>